الذين انعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن اولئك رفيقا whoever obeys Allah and his messenger they will be amongst the people the, the ones Allah has bestowed his graces upon اولئك الذي اولئك مع الذين انعم الله عليهم who are these people من النبيين the prophets those who truthfully affirmed and upheld their mission. The martyrs, those who gave their life struggling for the sake of the truth. Like Hamza, Sumayya, Mus'ab bin Umayr, and those after them. And the righteous people, وَأَحَسُنَا أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا what an excellent host to be amongst. So what's the key to being amongst that, that, that host? وَمَن يُتِعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Obeying Allah and His Messenger. So what better opening could there be? What better opening could there be? Could there be? Reminding us to seize and to use these two great keys to paradise. And then he says, أَمَّا uh, بَعْدْ so as to proceed, أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِسْمَعُوا مِنِّي أُبَيِّنُوا لَكُمْ فَإِنِّي لَا أَدْرِي لَعَلِّي لَا أَذْقَاكُمْ بَعْدَ عَامِ هَذَا فِي مَوْقِفِي هَذَا So he says uh, to proceed, أما بعد, O oh people, listen well to me, for I'm going to make some things clear to you as I do not know. Perhaps I will not meet you after this year of mine in this place. So the Prophet وسلم, he's already been given indications that his death is imminent. And that came when a little before this address, Hijjat al Wada, Surah Nasr was revealed. So when that surah was revealed, the Prophet وسلم, as did Umar, as did Ibn Abbas, عنهم, أجمعين, they realized that this was a foretelling of the death of the Prophet and then when the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned these words, لا أدري لا علي لا لا ألقاكم بعد عام هذا في موقف هذا أبو بكر رضي الله عنه also realized that the Prophet Sallallahu knew that his death was imminent and he was letting the Ummah know, but not in direct language. So we don't refer to someone's death directly. So we don't say, Mata uh, Fulan. Say, Tuwufia. Tuwufia Fulan. So and so has passed away. Even in English, we don't go to a person, Yeah, I heard that your father died. Yeah, he croaked last night. He kicked the bucket. Let's say, I heard about the passing of your father, that your father passed away. And so the Prophet Sallallahu why? Because to, to, out of consideration for the sentiments of the people and not to make something that's painful more painful. And so the Prophet Sallallahu doesn't want to pain the Ummah. Okay, Assalamu Alaikum, guys, I'm going to die in a couple months. <laughs> so they all drop dead from <laughs> sadness and grief. So he's letting them know, perhaps... I won't meet you at this place next year. And so those who had insight understood. Abu Bakr understood right away. Omar radiallahu anhu understood. Ibn Abbas, despite his young age, understood radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu his death was imminent. And then he addresses them. So he says, Ayyuhan Nas. Or oh, before that. So he's addressing the people at a level of, that unites us, at a human level. 
So they didn't say, Ayyuh al Because we can spy on the leaders of even nations that are allies, like Germany or Brazil or Mexico. Because we can do it, we do do it. And so uh, technical capability has been divorced from moral and ethical restraint. So the, the crisis of privacy is really emblematic of one of the great crises of the modern world, and that is the lack of moral restraint. So in other words, there are, high, there are no higher moral principles that will constrain what we can do and reduce it to what we should do, what's right, fitting, and proper to do. And so because I can, you know, film someone without their knowledge, I'll do it. Because I can put it on YouTube and it comes from my page and it'll drive traffic to my page and my Facebook, I'll get 10 more likes, that'll give me 20 likes. So I'll do it. And what about the restraints of the religion? For the wider society, they're, they're gone. Because we can build bombs that can kill millions of innocent people, we'll do it. You know, we don't, where are the moral restraints? Because we can make, we can genetically modify seeds and make new plants that uh, we can modify the tomatoes to make them redder, we can modify the bananas to make their shelf life longer. The bananas, they rot real fast and then you can't sell them. So we'll put a, we'll put a pig gene in the banana so it'll look plumper. We have plumper bananas. Yeah, man, that banana looks like a plump pig. Hmm. If you say that, you should start scratching your head. That's why when the bees are dying off, all of you have heard about the bees are dying. One reason is the genetic modification. The bee comes through the flower. The bee has been hardwired genetically to recognize by scent or smell or sight, however the bees recognize it, a certain pollen, they don't recognize it and they go away, they don't eat, they starve to death and they die. Pesticides, same thing. We, we want to kill all the weeds. We want to kill the competitor's crop. So we'll, we'll spray Roundup on everything. And the Monsanto genetically modified corn won't die. But your organic corn will die. If it doesn't die once it's cross-pollinated with the genetically modified, it's, going to, it's no longer going to be pure organic. And so because we can do it, we do do it. But we don't think about the consequences, the bees. We don't think about, we don't know the consequences to our health. But because we can do it, we do do it. So as Muslims, the first question we ask is not, can I do it? Should is, should I do it? Because Allah tells us, Tilka hududullahi fala taqrabuha. Tilka hududullahi fala ta'atabuha. These are the limits set by Allah. Don't come close to them. Don't approach them. Don't go beyond them. So Allah Ta'ala set limits. And he instructs us not to transcend, not to go by, beyond those limits. So it's not a question of what we can do. We can eat pork, right? Don't say, yeah, we can. Just answer in your heart. But you know we can physically eat pork, right? We might even like it. Some of you weren't always Muslim. Don't start reminiscing. But we can eat pork. We might even like it were we to eat it. But Allah said, don't eat it. So it's not a question of what we can do, it's a question of what we should do. And that's, but once you throw out those limits, then it's, it just becomes a question of what I can do. It's like I can seduce my neighbor's wife. You know, she's winking at me every time she passes. So I can, so it's, there's no moral restraint then, I'm just waiting for him to go on his next business trip. 
because I can do something. No, it's a question, should I do it? What are, and not just what are the worldly consequences or lack thereof. He'll never know. There won't be any consequences. No. What are the consequences in the next world? This is how a believer approaches reality. This is how we approach our situ situation. This is how we approach living in this world. What should I do in every situation? What is right and what is wrong? <coughs> I mentioned previously when Allah mentions in the Quran, Shah Ramadan, and Lady Unzila in the Quran, who the Linas will be united in the Wolf Rakan. So Allah Ta'ala says the month of Ramadan in which the Quran has begun has been revealed. Huda Nasi, guidance for humanity. Wabayinati min al Huda and and so and ex, uh, did a detailed explanation of that guidance. This is law. Wal Furqan and the criterion for distinguishing right from wrong. This is ethics. So the Furqan, you read the translation even, the, the criterion is the standard by which we determine what's right and what's wrong. So the essence of the revelation is law and its ethics. It's law and ethics, the two go together. We mentioned uh, last week in the, in the, the so, what enters people into Jannah? Taqwa Allah, mindfulness of the commandments and prohibition of Allah, of Allah adhering to the law, and good character, law and ethics. So, the guidance is the whole system. The bayinat is the law, and the furqan is the ethics. And you, the, the two can't be separated. The two cannot be separated. When we separate them, then, as we say, we devolve into a situation where we're governed by what we can do, what we're capable of doing. They say, you can steal, just make sure you don't get caught. And no, you can't steal. So it's not a question of, can you get away with it? You know, I, I was in a situation when I was a, a young, I was in high school, early high school, like ninth, tenth grade, and uh, we would we would go and buy all of our sneakers. Back then, we had Converse All Stars, but they weren't a fashion statement. It was like what you wore to play everything in. Uh, you didn't have tennis shoes and cross trainers and boxing shoes and basketball shoes. You just had Converse All-Stars. And you only had two colors, black and white. All the other stuff came when it, they were no longer, for athletic purposes, they were for fashion. <coughs> but, so there's one store, I forget the name of it. I went after school one day and I got there late. It was like about 6.10, they closed at 6 o'clock. And they forgot to lock up. And I went inside. Now here's this poor kid <laughs> from the projects inside of a sporting goods store. <laughs> so you know what I did? I went and found the cop and told him they forgot to lock up. And I might have regretted it, but you know, alhamdulillah, I felt good. I, and now I look back and I say, alhamdulillah, that I did that. Because that's what I, in that situation, that's what I'll meet a law on. I won't meet a law like I load it up. I got some for all my friends, and all my boys. And we didn't have cell phones. I found them, went to the phone booth and put a dime in and called up, yo man, the, the sports store is open. You guys gotta get down here quick. Clean them out. I went and found a cop. So it wasn't a question of what I could do. I could have swiped a lifetime supply of speed sneakers and football cleats and baseball gloves. It is what I should do. So I did what I should have done. And we should never lose sight of what we should do in every situation we find ourselves in. 
What is the ruling of Allah in this situation? And if we do that, this is, this is part of the trust that the deen involves. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكْ مَنْ تُؤَدُّ الْأَمَنَاتِ لَأَهْلِهَا So we, we have a trust. Our children are trust. What are we doing with them? How are we guiding them? Are we protecting them from all of this facade? Are we letting the television babysit them? Just brainwash them and inundate their, 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 their innocent brains and their innocent hearts with all of the facade and all of the occult and all of these things that are being pushed, foisted onto the people via the medium of television. Do we let them listen to this lewd and decent music because we want them to be cool and to be able to relate? Or are we trying to guide, raise them in a way where they'll be conscious of Allah, conscious of the Messenger of Allah, and shield them from these negative influences? Even if it means, inshallah, one day they'll appreciate it. Their circle of friends is very small. Because, you know, we don't watch television, so you're not going to have friends with anyone who does because they're just going to corrupt you. So, we have to make hard decisions. But, one day we'll answer to you. If we say, I did my best, then and that will be good. But if we didn't do our best, we're not going to be able to fake it when we stand before Allah Ta'ala. Wallahu al-musta'an. Uh, the, the, this uh, verse in Allah يَأْمُرْكُمْ أَنْ تُعَدُّ الْأَمَنَاتِ الْأَهْلِهَا وَإِذَا حَكَمْتُمْ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ أَنْ تَحْكُمُ بِالْعَدْلِ Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah says this is the, an expression of the philosophy that governs the relationship between the rulers and the ruled. That the rulers have a trust that they have to deliver to those they're ruling. So government shouldn't be self-serving. Government shouldn't ser serve the interest of the, of the strong and the rich and the wealthy. That's what happens now. So the rich people, you know, we want, uh, we want more subsidies for major farming corporations like Monsanto. We mentioned Cargill, Midlands, Archer, Archer Daniels, and these big agribusiness concerns, that's what the farm bill has in it. And we want to cut billions of dollars to poor people who are getting food stamps. Right? And so that's what they do. Why? Because all these big companies, look when they're in the, here and in Washington State, or was it Oregon's at, the uh, GMO labeling? Washington. Washington State, right? Why was it defeated? It started out wide margin. People are for the, the ballot measure. As time goes on, and Monsanto and the rest of them are pumping all of this money into these television campaigns, brainwashing people, and then they end up losing by double digits. And so, so who gets their way? The rich get their way. The powerful get their way. And the poor people just have to suffer the consequences. This is not a question of the government doesn't have money. More and more money gets directed towards the wealthiest individuals and concerns in society. It goes to Wall Street. It doesn't go to Main Street, even though it came from Main Street. It came from the taxpayers. But the taxpayers just poor, ordinary people they don't know how or, or can't afford to have lobbyists in Washington, three or four or five for every elected representative. They don't have those connections. They don't have the money to put their commercials on television to advocate for their interest. It's the responsibility of government to advocate for them. After all, it's supposed to be government for, by, and of the people. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was elected uh, as the Khalifa, his first speech, amongst the things he said, Ad-da'ifu, ad-da'ifu fiku, qawi, fikum, qawiyun indi, hata akhudha lahu al-haq. 
The, the weak amongst you is strong with me until I take the right that's owed to him. وَالْقَوِيُّ فِيكُمْ ضَعِيفٌ عِنْدِي حَتَّى أَخُذَ مِنْهُ الْحَقِّ إِنْشَاءَ اللَّهِ And the one who's strong with you is weak with me until I take from him the right he owes to others, if Allah so wills. This is the philosophy of government. He understood, like, this is a trust. This isn't about me. It's not about the rich and powerful. It's about serving the people, and that includes serving the poorest of the people. And when, when, a, when a, a society neglects its poor people, it's on the way out. This is on the way out. Because we believe in, the Marxists believe in economic determinism. Right? Economic determinism. If you want to know how a society functions, if you want to know the social order of a society, the cultural mores of society, look at the economic infrastructure and you will know the social superstructure. This is Marxism. We as, as Muslims, we have what we call spiritual determinism. If you want to know the social and cultural structure of the society, look at the state of the people's hearts. Look at their morals. Look at their relationship with their creator. And you'll know about what's going on culturally and socially. You'll know about what's going to befall the, that people. And when a people disregard their poor people, trample on the interests of their poor people, they're inviting divine wrath upon them. May Allah, may Allah spare us. May Allah Ta'ala spare us. Tayyip, so we should respect privacy. Like this is, people have permission to record, to organize it anyway. But if, and you can say, listen, this part, A, B, C, D, if you're going to post this, edit that out. If, if that process of consultation is absent, then a sacred trust has been violated. Because, for example, this is a private gathering. We're not talking to the whole world. We're talking to the people here. So people here understand the context. Everyone here is a Muslim understand the context of what we're talking about, understand the references, understand if something is, is literal or if, or if something involves uh, hyperbole for rhetorical effect. People understand that. People out there might not understand that. And so what people here would take is just uh, a passing thought Someone out, out there might take as a, as a conspiracy to overthrow the government. And so there, there is a trust that's involved in a private gathering. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned, al majalis bil amana. Private gatherings involve a sacred trust. He also said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if a person speaks and then leaves, what they said is a trust with those they spoke to. In other words, they're not free to broadcast that. They're not free to broadcast that. And that's mainly in, in private. This is kind of semi-private. Anyone can walk in. But if you're having a private conversation, it might be with your spouse, it might be with your neighbor or co-worker, it involves a sacred trust. And that trust should be respected. And then, then that should be incorporated into, into our laws, our doctrine. This is a part of our religion. So the Prophet Sallallahu emphasized uh, that trust. One of the greatest trusts, as we mentioned, is money and wealth. That's something we've been entrusted with. 
Give them from the wealth of Allah He's given you. It's not our wealth, it's Allah's wealth. If you think it's yours, <laughs> take it with you when you go. <laughs> you think that car is yours? Then will wait until you die. Someone else is going to get behind the wheel. <sighs> Allah Akbar, man, this is nice. Brother Ahmed's car is so nice. Man, this seat is so soft. You're not going to drive that car into your grave and then put the lid on the casket and the car is going to stay with someone else is going to drive the car. Someone else is going to spend your money. Believe me, they'll get access to it. You think it's in a safe deposit box. If they invent a way to bring me back, it'll be waiting for me. No, it won't. It's going to be gone. It's in a safe. Someone will figure out the combination. Believe me, they'll bring in an expert of the stethoscope. <laughs> They're going to get it. It's not yours. It's going to go. The car, someone else is going to live in your house. It might be your children, their family. Someone else is going to be in there. It's not ours. It's a loss. It's not a loss. It's a law he entrusts us with it. How do we use it? Do we use it for our akhirah? Everything in this world, if we don't use it for our akhirah, is cursed. And this is the meaning, dunya mal'una. The world is cursed. If we lose, use it for our akhirah, it's a benefit. Al dunya mata'. It's up to us how we use it. Which of the two? Al dunya mal'una. Al dunya mata'. The world is cursed. The world is something to be utilized. Mata is something be, to be benefited from. So it's up to us how we use it. What's it going to be? If we use it for akhira, it's mata. If we use it for just self-aggrandizement, just to pile up more and more wealth, al takathur hatta zurtumul maqabir. So they're distracted by piling up piling up the wherewithal of the world. That's what we're doing, right? We, we pile up. We used to live in little one-story houses. Now we have two stories, three stories. It's still only the two or three of us, husband, wife, one or two children. We used to live fine in the one-story house. al takathur second story, third story. Until you visit the grave. Then the reality be made known. All of that was useless. My wealth doesn't, doesn't benefit me in any way. Unless we spent it in good ways. Then it has an edger that's waiting for us. So, he then talks about Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam riba, interest. فقال وإن الرب الجاهلية موضوع ولكن لكم رؤوس أموالكم لا تظلمون ولا تظلمون وقضى الله أنه لا ربا وإن أول ربا أبدأ به عمي العباس بن عبد المطلب. So he says that the interest from usurious transactions contracted before Islam is waived. However, you can keep the principle involved. You will not oppress others, nor will you be oppressed. Allah has decreed that there is to be no interest, and the first interest to be waived is owned, owed to my uncle Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. So the Prophet, after telling people all of this <coughs> ill gotten wealth is null and void, he's not saying for you guys, but for me and my family. You know, I'm the prophet after all, so, you know, we have to live. No, he said, that, and I'm starting with my own family, my uncle Abbas. Anyone who owes him any interest is void. You don't owe him anything, just the principle. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So there's a connection, he mentions You won't oppress others, nor will you be oppressed. So there's a connection between riba and oppression. Oppression of self, oppression of others. Right? 
All of the oppression, all of the wars in this system, they emanate from interest. Without interest, you couldn't afford to finance these war machines. You couldn't do it. In World War II, they were selling war bonds. Interest-based. These massive accumulations of wealth by leveraging money. Derivatives and hedge funds and financial instruments. They're all RIBA-based. You couldn't, you couldn't do it. So I'm gonna... The prohibition of RIBA is ancient. So these practices, they're ancient. They're not new. The, a globalized system of finance built on interest, that's new. But in the Bible, interest is condemned in the strongest term. So we'll just share some of that, give you an indication. If you lend money to any of my people who are poor amongst you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Exodus 22, 25. Take no interest, no usury or interest from him, but fear God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. Leviticus 36, 37. So food. So when, when the Prophet Sallallahu forbade interest, and the Qur'an forbade interest, it's in food, it's in money. Al-dhahab bil-dhahab, wal-fidda bil-fidda, wal-milh bil-milh, wal-qum bil-qum. Yadan bi yad, mithl bi mithl. So gold for gold, silver for silver, not allowed. Salt for salt. I'll lend you two cu a cup of salt, but when you pay me back, you have to give me two cups. It's haram. Flour for uh, wheat for wheat. So like for like. Handful for handful. Like for like. It has to be equal. With no increase. So it's interesting that in Leviticus mentions food. You should not lend him your money for using him. Don't lend him your food at a profit. You shall not charge interest to your brother, interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest. The good man is described. Here's the description of the good man from the Bible. If he has not oppressed anyone, but has re restored to the debtor his pledge, has robbed no one by violence, but has given his bread to the hungry, and covered the naked with clothing, if he has not exacted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true judgment between man and man, if he has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 18, 7 through 9. Okay. Uh, the bad man. This is the bad man. He eats at the mountain shrines. He defiles his neighbor's wife. He oppresses the poor and needy. He commits robbery. He does not return what he took and pledged. He looks at the, to the idols. He does detestable things. He lends at interest and takes a profit. Will such a man live? He will not because he has done all of these detestable things. He is to be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. This is a few of the things that the Bible mentions condemning usury and interest. The uh, Dante inherited this Christian tradition. So in his Inferno, he puts the, the ones who deal in interest in a lower level of hell than murderers. And the, the commentator explained why. So we read from, from Dante, and then uh, some commentary from one of the scholars, one of the Mufassirin of Dante. So he says, uh, quote, uh, once more go back a little to the point. I said, where you state in a usury offends the divine goodness and untie the knot. 
philosophy to one who understands points out, and on more than one occasion, how nature gathers her entire course from divine intellect and divine art. And if you follow nature as a pupil does his master, in effect your art is like the grandchild of God. Art here means all of the creative uh, potential of human beings. So, Art isn't just painting, and there's all the work, constructive work, that emanates from the divine law. The, the law of nature is a reflection of the divine law in the Christian theological sense. It's very close to the Muslim sense. So, and then he says, so he said, uh, your art is like the grandchild of our God. For art and nature, if you will, will recall the opening, opening of Genesis, man is meant to earn his way and further mankind. But still the usurer takes another way. He scorns nature and her follower, art, because he puts his hope in something else. In other words, the usurer doesn't earn his own way through the creative work of his hands. He makes money just sitting back. He makes money from money. And this was considered a, a violation of God's law. And the foundation of, of exploiting one's fellow human being, this is why it was considered worse than murder. So the, the commentator says, he says, Dante puts the usurers in the lowest subcircle of the seventh circle of hell, with others whose sins are regarded as doing violence against nature and nature's God. Many people have noted that usurers are placed deeper into hell than violent murderers, violent suicides, blasphemers, and sodomites. Because all of these were considered as going against than uh, nature and against God, who's established nature and who's established the foundation for law that emanates. This is natural law from the natural order that God created, both in humans, is the natural disposition of law God has created people upon. Let there be no alteration in the creation of Allah. And so, usury is an alteration in that law. Dante regards usurers as perverting art, i.e. productive skill, which means by means of which we are supposed to produce and create and thereby imitate the goodness of God. So we create, we make a house for someone to live in, to take shelter from. It's an act of goodness. We, we make a plow for someone to till their fields. It's an act of goodness. So this is a reflection of the goodness of God. The, 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 the Muslim gives charity to the wayfarer. Why? Because we're all wayfarers in the world and God spends on us to help us get through. So we're imitating the goodness of God when we assist the wayfarer to help them move on their way. It merely gives the uh, usury, uh, uh, Dante re regards us usurers as perverting art, i.e. productive skill, by means of which we are supposed to produce and create and thereby imitate the goodness of God. Usury is the anti-art. It produces nothing substantial, being just a set of multiplication games with money and therefore does not really contribute anything thing to, quote, earning one's way and furthering humankind. It merely gives the illusion of doing so, and is therefore a sort of mockery of both human reason and divine providence, indeed a sort of universal violence against neighbor, God, and one's own reason, an extraordinarily efficient form of violence by which you do the most damage with the least effort. This, this is how pre-modern people looked at things that are normal now. People, how can we live without interest? The, so everything that shaitan 
introduces and then normalizes, then it becomes a fait accompli. It's an accomplished fact, a done deal. That's a good translation. If you want to know, what does fait accompli mean? It means a done deal. It's a done deal. You can't go back. Uh, you can't get rid of cell phone. You can't live without it. We lived without it 15 years ago. Life was fine. People were prospering. No one was dropping dead because of them. We need a cell phone. What's that? Are well, these things that's going to take over all of your private time 10 years from now? Really? Interesting. <laughs> Allah Mustan. So the Quran and Sunnah inherits this tradition, uh, if you will. It's not a good word to say inherit it, but uh, continues this tradition that we find articulated in the Bible. There are, there are two major crimes, sin. There's one that uh, <clears throat> not well known, I actually forgot it. It's in, in the uh, Hajar Haytami's list of the Kaba'il. But Imam Dahabi doesn't list it. But there are two sins that Allah declares war on the perpetrator. He declares war on the one who engages in interest, and he declares war on the one who transgresses against his awliyat, his befriended and beloved. That's it. So these must be really, really grave things. So Allah Ta'ala said, Ya yuhalladina amnu taqullah wa dhu man baqiya min awribayin fun. What is the second one? The second one, Man adali waliyan faqad adhantuhu bilharb. So transgression against the awliya of Allah. And and then riba. Ya yuhalladina amnu taqullah wa dhu man baqiya min awribayin kun tum mu'minin fin lam tafalu. Fa'adhanu biharb min Allahi wa rasoolih. So, all you believers, uh, be mindful of Allah and leave off what remains of riba over and beyond your principle. Leave it. If indeed you are believers, and if you fail to do so, be warned of war from Allah and His Messenger. And if you repent, then you can have your principle. You will not harm, oppress anyone, nor will you be oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ, one of the most humiliating. Now think what I will mention, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, an anasin radiallahu an, qaa qala Rasulullahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, arriba sab'un huban. So interest involves 70 degrees of sin. So riba involves seven degrees of sin. The lightest of them, the least of them, is like a man having relations with his mother. That's the lowest. So what is the 70th one? Ahwanuha ka waq'ir rajuli ala ummi Ya Latif That's serious stuff for people to take this stuff so lightly Would you translate the last sentence? And then he said wa fi riwayatin in another version uh, the, it's the same meaning, different wording. The least of these 70 degrees, the least is like a man who has relations with his wife. So one uses a verb, one uses the, the noun. And that's Allah. So the Prophet, Allah and His Messenger, establish an interest-free economic order. Can't say you can't do it. The Muslims did it. And there was prosperity. People prospered. There was prosperity. Because Muslims took this seriously. 
Muslims took it seriously. So, what today, do you think it, people can benefit? There's a, a, a book I highly recommend. Actually, it's an online, it's an online, it's an extensive online article called The History of Usury Prohibition by an individual by the name of Alistair Macintosh. This is a quote from his book. He says, in particular, it is the belief of the authors that individuals or organizations in the West with money to invest, especially those which like to consider themselves as being ethical, might have rather more to learn from Islam than is generally acknowledged. But first, society needs to be re-conscientized, yani regain a consciousness to the relevance of the age-old usury debate in modern times. So, what, what the authors are saying is that the Muslims have something to teach us in this realm, but before we can even begin to learn what the Muslims have to offer, we have to gain the consciousness necessary to realize the significance and damage that interest in usury causes. I poor people, I, I went in one of these check cashing places uh, several months back. I was trying to send the Western Union. And the Safeway, the machine was broken. And next door was the Rite Aid, their machine was broken. Next door, so they said, go to the check cashing place. They, they have Western Union. So I went to the check cashing place. I'm the lad, the machine was, broken, was up. But I had to wait because there were people in front of me. So I started reading the conditions for these payday loans. There was one loan. You know how much the interest was for the loan? Take a guess. 40%. 40%. Allah Akbar. You're close in a sense. What did you say here? I said 40%. 40%? You're both close. But take your 40% and multiply it by 10. It was 400%. 400%. So if this miskin who's working at Burger King and gets a $300 loan because his car broke and he can't pay his rent and fix his car with the money he makes flipping burgers at Burger King, he gets a $300 loan at 400% interest misses a few payments, he's going to be in debt for the rest of his life. It's criminal. This is what's going on. It's criminal. And you know what made it possible? Any interest is bad. That's why the, some of the biblical versions, you know, they say usury and interest. Interest was, interest, pure usury was exorbitant interest and many of the, who, those who distinguish between the two. There was a usury law in this country. There was a ceiling. You couldn't have any interest-based ba transaction that exceeded the ceiling. You know who got rid of the ceiling? It wasn't the Republicans. Bill Clinton. You know what the ceiling was? Take a guess. Huh? 100%. 9%. 9%. So, Clinton got rid of Glass-Steagall, so banks couldn't be finance houses, finance houses couldn't be savings banks, insurance companies couldn't be. That was the Glass-Steagall Act. Clinton got rid of it. It paved the way for the big collapse. But before the big collapse, these exorbitant amounts of money, Clinton got rid of the usury ceiling. So anyway, Muslims have something to offer, but we have to hold on. We're, we're like the last man standing, and we're like about to fall, like we, we're punch drunk. We're almost out on our feet, but we're still standing. So we have to take the water, pour it over our head, wake up, and get back in the ring and start throwing some haymakers. We're the last man standing. 
as a community, those who serious, take seriously the prohibition of interest. A lot of you are renting houses because you don't want to pay interest a mortgage. A lot of you are living in a small house because you bought it cash. You couldn't afford one of a big enough house for your family. Why? Because you take interest, the prohibition, seriously. When you hear a war from Allah, you shake, get nervous. So, may Allah give us tawfiq to stand on and be strong and hold on. And to set an example for others. Because if, if we fall, then who is someone like Alistair or Macintosh going to look towards? So and this is, go back to the trust. This is the trust that we're holding for humanity. If we squander the trust, it's lost. So the Prophet and these are, you notice virtually everything that, that's been mentioned so far, and that will be mentioned subsequently, is, is a reflection of either a verse of, of, of the Quran or hadith. So you mentioned, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the, hadith, yani, uh, al-Muslim, akhu al-Muslim, la yavlimu, la yakudhuluhu, la yakdibu, wa la yahkiruhu, al-Muslim, akhu al-Muslim, kullu al-Muslim, ya'ala al-Muslim, al-Haram, damu, malu, ibdu. So, all of these teachings are reflecting, uh, and just restating, in a final, advice and counsel to the Ummah and to humanity at large the message of the Qur'an and Sunnah. We'll stop here and after the event, quickly if there are any questions, we'll have time for a couple questions before they make their problem inshallah. Allah Any question over here? Yes, sir. <coughs> it's related to the rain prayer. Huh? <coughs> the prayer of the rain. Yeah. There are some Christians. It me, rained. Yeah, they sent me like comments like they were happy the rain has it's, it's raining now. It's, yeah. it's supposed to rain tomorrow, Saturday, and Sunday. Inshallah, Allah open the gates. Inshallah. Yeah, we received some even cards or something. Yeah, People thanking us for. Alhamdulillah. Nah. Name of that article again? Excuse me? The article. Oh, uh, 
History of the Prohibition of Interest by Alistair McIntosh. Yes. It's, it's all pro prohibited. Taking it, using it, and there, no, no, no. So it's, it's all the same. Yes. But here, say if you have a, a bank account and the interest, you should give the interest away anonymously. In other words, you have a bank account or some other and they're giving you interest, you should give it away in charity anonymously. You shouldn't have it as if something you want credit for. Just give it away. There, there's, a, there's an opinion in the Hanafi school that you can take interest in the lands that aren't governed by Muslims, but it's a minority opinion. I think it's the uh, opinion of uh, one of the imams Either, but it's rejected by the others, and they're all much tags. So I think it's maybe Muhammad, but it's rejected by Imam Abu Hanifa and uh, uh, the other much tags. Abu Yusuf. No. But the other schools don't give that fact at all. It's haram, straight up haram. So we could, we could have open with questions next time. Inshallah. Inshallah, I'm not going to be late. I wasn't late today. <laughs> Inshallah. Allah barik fikum. Subhanahu سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا نحسي ثناء عليك أنت كما ذلك على نسل اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Right, so uh, any questions from last week? Because we left uh, somewhat of her. <coughs> questions, comments? No? Okay. So uh, I think the last thing we discussed was. Uh, oh, usury, interest. So after uh, mentioning the relieving of interest and then starting with his own family, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his uncle Abbas, and Abdul Muttalib, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, radiallahu anhu, he then uh, goes into the issue of blood feuds. So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, faqala, رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن دماء الجاهلية موضوعة وإن أول دم نبدو به دم عمرو بن ربيعة بن الحارث بن عبد عبد المطلب وإن مآثر الجاهلية موضوعة غير السدانة والسقايا والعمل قيود والشبه والشبه العمل والشبه العمل ما قتل بالعصا والحجرة وفيه مئة مئة بعير فمن زال فهو من أهل الجاهلية ألا هل بلغت اللهم فاشهد. So he says صلى الله عليه وسلم the blood retribution of pre-Islamic times is remitted and the first claim of blood we remit is that of Amr the son of Rabia the son of Al-Harith the son of Abd al-Muttalib who was a relative of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, who was killed by members of Bani Hudayl. And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, there's no one who can just go out and kill someone from Bani Hudayl in retaliation. Uh, 
Then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of the institutions of pre-Islamic days avoided other than the institution of custodianship of the Kaaba, Jazakallah khair, and uh, providing water to the pilgrims. This is the real small. This is what a small, a small little Dixie cup. This was small when I was growing up. This is what I'm going to do. Alhamdulillah. Now a small is like this. And a large is 64 ounce big gulp. The straw is fatter than that yellow wire there. It's like a water hose. So they can sell you more sugar. And the farmers whose corn is being subsidized can sell you more high fructose corn syrup and everything. And people can get bigger and bigger. Look at yearbooks from the 60s, like high school and college yearbook. Everyone's skinny. Look at yearbooks now. Don't. You might get discouraged. So, Alhamdulillah for the small. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So it says, all of the institutions of pre-Islamic pre days avoided other than the institution of the custodianship of the Kaaba and that of providing water to the pilgrims. In other words, those stayed with the people who were operating them during the time of Jahiliyyah. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, murder is subject to retribution, while manslaughter such as death resulting from a stick or stone that will ordinarily not kill is governed by blood money. Compensation owed to the family of the deceased is 100 camels. Whoever gives or demands more is displaying pre-Islamic behavior. Have I not delivered the message? All I'll bear witness. So the Prophet in this passage, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is consolidating the new order that Islam has established by providing institutional structure, both human and physical institutions the human institutions, such as the eradication of blood feuds. So those are institutions. They're people in organized way, behaving in certain ways as groups. So he's saying one thing you can't do, you can no longer just kill people in these back and forth blood feuds. Here we have the famous case of the Hatfields and the McCoys. Some of you have heard of that. The Hatfields and the McCoys. Who have you heard of the Hatfields? Right. Willie Nelson, the successful life we're living got us feuding like the Hatfields and, the, and McCoys. So anyway, or maybe Kenny Rogers, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not big into country music, but one of those guys. Uh, so, and like, or more in recent times, the Bloods and the Crips, for the Norteños and Soilenos, these street gangs that you kill one of them, they kill any one of your guys. It doesn't matter if that person was responsible or not. So you're walking down the street, you have one of the wrong color kufi. Boy, I have one of Crip kufi. I'm in trouble. And the blood see you, so, and you don't have your red kufi in your pocket. You can't switch up real fast. So they just shoot you. So this is what the Prophet Wasallam is ending, this kind of uh, pre-Islamic ignorance that leads to oppression and loss of life. Then the physical institutions, such as the institution of providing the, the water, the custodianship of the Kaaba, those remain, but a lot of the others uh, were ended. Then he mentions uh, the murder. So we talked about the sanctity of life, but here he's uh, mentioning that if someone, and this is a uh, very, uh, modern approach, uh, legal approach. If someone, so here we have manslaughter. If someone kills, and this is why we translated it, unintentional killing as manslaughter. In other words, if, if, you, if you threw a rock maybe that big at someone, you wanted to hit them, and maybe you wanted to hurt them, but you didn't intend to kill them, but the rock, it hit them just right, so right in the temple, bam! They just expired. That would be manslaughter. Why? Because, so he said, مَنْقُوتِنَا بِالْعَصَى وَالْحَجَرَ So a stick or stone that wouldn't ordinarily kill. So a little rock or a rod, you might 
smack someone with a, a thin stick and you hit them just right, right at the base of their neck and they expire. That would be manslaughter. In that case, no one can demand that you're killed in retribution. So that would not be a capital offense, as we say, in our legal system. But it would be uh, a crime that, we might, that demanded the dia or 100 camels. And there's a very important point that the Prophet makes here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that is whoever increases from Zada for whom in Ahl al Whoever gives more, demands more, is from the days of pre Islamic ignorance. So, a, a deeper lesson in that is that our religion is based on taqwa, it's based on mindfulness of Allah, of His commandments and prohibitions. It's not based on doing more when we're not asked to do more. Definitely not doing less when we're asked to do more. So we do what Allah Ta'ala asks. So by way of example, there's, there's no virtue in uh, delaying breaking the fast in Ramadan. But the sunnah is once you are sure the sun is down. So that doesn't mean when the calendar says like 8.13. So 8.13, the sun is here, on by the calendar. Sunset, this is sunset. So you should add a couple of minutes because this is sunset with Islam. This is the horizon. This is the sun. Okay, there's some yellow. That's the sun. This is when the calendar says sunset. This is where it's actually sunset. So you should wait a couple of minutes. When this goes completely below. So you should wait a couple minutes. But well, once you wait a couple minutes, you look, and you're sure the sun is down, you hasten to break the fast. There's no virtue. They bring you the water and a couple dates. Well, I'm a tough guy. I'll wait till after Tarawi. <laughs> strong, I don't No, you hasten to break the fast. That's from the Sunnah. Or the Sahur in the morning, you don't delay the meal or put it off. Well, you know, I want to fill it today. So I'm not going to eat any breakfast before fasting. There's no virtue in that. There's a virtue is to take the pre-dawn meal, which, which makes the fast more challenging because you have to get up early. So some people, it's not that they want to be tough and they skip suhoor, it's that they want to sleep for an extra two hours. And so they skip it. Say, so, you know, what? can fine. Night. Right before I go to bed, I'll drink a lot of water, and I'll set my clock for 6.40. And the sun's coming up at 7, and so I'll wake up and I'll pray, Mom, I'll pray Fajr, and then I'll just fast. That's not, there's no virtue in that. The virtue is in following what Allah and His Messenger has instructed us. So in this case, 100 camels for men zada for women for women if you give more or demand more you know my son was really precious i know you didn't mean to kill him but we want 200 camels and the men jahiliya person who does that is from the people of pre-islamic ignorance i know you're poor and it's hard on you so you can give us 75. no what the prophet said so so, may Allah Ta'ala bless us to, to realize and to appreciate the wisdom uh, in that. Another thing, uh, going back to the uh, blood fuels, is that the tit-for-tat mentality. The Prophet ﷺ is reminding the people, you don't have time for this nonsense. Because the deeper it goes, the tit-for-tat goes, they get one of ours, we get one of theirs, it becomes harder and harder. It requires more and more time, and more and more energy, and more and more exertion, at any level. Even internationally, you see nations get involved, this tit-for-tat, tit-for-tat, and uh, ends up escalating and escalating, requiring, demanding more and more lives, more and more money more and more suffering from, uh, from, from, from innocent people. 
So the Prophet is ending that mentality. So big things and small things in our personal relations. Don't, don't allow yourself to get caught up in a cycle of tit for tat retaliation. You know, they, you stepped on my toe, the next time I see the brother, I'm gonna step on his toe. He probably didn't even see your foot. But you're thinking at such a petty level, say, next time I see the brother, I'll give him a nice hug. And if he has a problem, then he'll have a bigger problem. Because someone he doesn't like is hugging. So that's your revenge. <laughs> But we don't have time, brothers and sisters. Life is too short, and we should be focusing on a lot. If I'm thinking about a lot, I didn't even feel my toe being stepped on. I just go home and it's swollen. I'm like, man, how'd that happen? But if, why? I was thinking about a lot, so I was gone. I didn't feel anything. Kun ma Allah wa la Be with Allah. Don't worry about people, and in that sense. So don't worry about who stepped on your toe, who gave you a gift, or didn't give you a gift. Yeah. Worry about who gave you a gift so you can thank them, but not who didn't give you a gift, and you gave them a gift, and they never gave you a gift, so next year I'm not going to give them a gift when Eve comes. No Eve gift for them. No. Because they didn't give me one. I mean, what's happening? They're, your mentality is going down, down, down. It should be going up, up, up. Allah, Allah, Allah. You should be thinking about a lot because we never know when we're going to meet him. We never know when we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We could think we could be in perfect health, perfect health. And may Allah protect us. The earth could swallow us. You guys hear about the, the Corvette Museum? The earth, a big sinkhole in Kentucky swallowed all the cars. You heard of it? I just heard about it driving here, driving. It said like half of the museum, just a big sinkhole opened up and swallowed the cars. It's happening more and more. The guy in Florida, right, sleeping in his bed, the earth opens up. It can happen to us, right? Perfect health, nothing wrong, and the earth just swallows up, swallows us. Something just falls on our head. We don't, we don't know. So we, 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 don't, we, we shouldn't assume we have so much time left in this world that we have the luxury of spending it on petty, insignificant things. But we have to be with Allah. We have to be with Allah. La ilaha illallah. So after uh, mentioning uh, those things, and then another point that can be made here, is that just as the Prophet Sallallahu in the usury, he uh, eliminated any interest that was owed to his own uncle. He started with his family. And the same thing here. So he started with Amr al-Masar uh, al-Rasulillah, Amr bin Rabi'a, bin al-Harith, bin Abdul Muttalib. He started with his own family, his own relative. He didn't start with, okay, this is a new policy, but it's for you guys, not me. And he started with his own family. So to lead by example, this is very important for people in leadership. Leaders have to be exemplary, meaning uh, examples for people to follow. So exemplary from example. So a leader doesn't just talk. As they say, doesn't just talk the talk. A leader has to walk the walk. Otherwise, people, it becomes hollow. And the, and the people don't take the, the person seriously. So if you're in a position of responsibility, you have to make sure you start with yourself. so, don't forbid a, a characteristic and then you come with that which you're forbidden. It's a shame on you, a great shame on you if you were to do that. So, the Prophet ﷺ, when he forbade the blood retribution, 
he started by forbidding his own family from retaliating. When he forbade interest, he started by forbidding anyone to give the interest they owed to a member of his family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, uh, and, and this illustrates that in Islam, all of us from the top, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the very top, to the, what would be the lowest, if you will, quote unquote, because no believer is low, but the, the lowest member of the ummah, we're all, when Allah amr on, مؤمنين بما أمر المرسلين مرسلين بما أمر به المؤمنين or the opposite so Allah has commanded the prophets messengers with what he's commanded the believers with so we're all under the same commandments we're all under the same prohibitions and we should never lose sight of that we shouldn't be people we get up in front of people and admonish them and with wonderful words and then our actions betray our words. There should be a consistency between the actions and words. There should be a consistency between leaders and followers. There should be total consistency. So we're like one united hand all together. So then after that he, he mentions something about shaitan. Shaitan is our enemy. So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Amma Badu Ayuhan Nasu, in the Shaytan of Qad Yaisa, and you are Bada Fi Abdi Kum Hadihi, while I can hook out a Rodia and you taa, Fima Siwa Delica Mimma to Haki Runa Min Amerikum, Fahdruhu Ala Dinikum. So he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, to proceed on Mabad, O people, Satan has despaired that he will be worshipped in this land of yours. However, he is pleased to be obeyed in other ways, in your seemingly insignificant actions. So, things you think are not that big, it's not that important. So, beware of him for the sake of your religion. There it says, أَمَّا بَعْدُ أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ قَدْ يَئِسَ أَنْ يُعْبَدَ فِي أَرْضِكُمْ هَذِهِ وَلَكِنَّهُ قَدْ رَضِيَ أَنْ يُطَاعَ فِي مَا سِوَى ذَلِكَ مِمَّا تُحَقِّرُونَ مَنْ عَمَالِكُمْ فَاحْذَرُوهُ عَلَى دِينِكُمْ So beware of Satan for the sake of your religion. Satan is at war with us. He has his dupes. And he's, he realizes he's not going to get most believers, even the average believer, even weak believers, with, with grave transgression. So shaitan's not going to get anyone here to eat a ham sandwich uh, laced with bacon smothered in swine. He knows it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. He's not, he's not going to get most people to, to eat pork. He's not going to get most people to drink. There are Muslims that drink. May Allah uh, rid them of, of that accursed habit. But most, most Muslims don't drink. Even some Muslim countries, they have liquor stores. A'udhu Billah. Most Muslims don't buy the alcohol. They just walk by and mind their business. They have some weak people. Most Muslims don't drink. Shaitan's not going to get most Muslims to drink. He's not going to get most Muslims to eat pork, etc. But he comes in other directions where people aren't so vigilant. And so we have to be on guard against them. So one of the ways that we're on guard is take the religion seriously. Allah Ta'ala when he tells us, Ya yuhalladina amunu dhukhulu fi silmi kaffa. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ مُبِينٌ Oh, you believers, enter totally into Islam. Two things. Take it all. Don't take some and leave some. I like this. I don't like that. The religion is to challenge us with some things we might not necessarily like. So we're, we're to be, if, if everything is totally consistent with us, we should say, you know, either we've arrived at a high station or 
we should we should examine what we're doing because we might be distorting things so that they're easy and light. You know, I don't like this, so it's really not part of Islam. Then, oh, this isn't really a part of Islam. Oh, this would go against fundamental principles of human rights, so that can't be a part of Islam. And so this isn't and that. And then what we're left with, with is everything that we like and everything we're comfortable with. That's a problem. Because some things we should have to really be challenged by. Allah says He's test us. Surely we're going to test you with something, not overwhelming amount, but something of fear and hunger and loss of lives and fruits, our lives and wealth and fruits. Give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere. So we, we have to persevere through the trials. He's created death and life to test you, which of you are best indeed. So, a test is something that challenges us. A test is something that challenges us. So the religion should challenge us. It should set a higher bar. We want to lower the bar, some of us. So the bar is here, we want to bring it down here so we can skip over it. Instead of training and strengthening our legs and improving our technique so we can jump over it. High jump, right? So we want to bring the bar down. You don't get medals for bringing the bar down. You don't get distinction for bringing the bar down. You get distinction for jumping over the bar when it's high. MashaAllah, that's a gold medal jump. He jumped seven feet and whatever inches. Then he brought the down bar down to five foot and then jumped over it. So we should let leave the bar where Allah Ta'ala placed it and strengthen ourselves so that we're capable of jumping over the bar. Those are the people that make a difference in the world. We were at the uh, Averroes. How many of you at the Averroes fundraiser? Yeah. And did you stay for our Dr. Leonard Satchin? Yeah, yeah and I, I bought his book, Boys Adrift. And just he's, he's documenting the slacker culture of, of boys, and boys meaning men who still act like boys. Dr. Leonard Sachs, S-A-X, S-A-X, like saxophone, sax. So he, he's just documenting some of the reasons that increasingly uh, young men don't mature and then get into a slacker culture more and more, staying at home with their parents, not having the motivation to go out, not having the inspire, inspiration to succeed in school. And... Uh, the, 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 the point is Muslims, we can easily become religious slackers and not people who challenge ourselves. I want to learn Arabic. I want to learn Quran. I want to, uh, I want to uh, fast voluntarily sometimes. I challenge ourselves because, you know, I do my five prayers. I fast Ramadan, which is good. That's the minimum requirement for Jannah. And we want everyone in Jannah. We're not saying people who do that, they won't go to Jannah. But who are the people that have cultivated within themselves the inner strength to go out there and assist others? To so assist others, you have to have an excess, generally speaking. You, you can't give what you don't have. So there has to be an excess of faith, an excess of spiritual fortitude for that to spill over to others. And people are hurting, people are suffering. So if we just, okay, you know, I'm going to take it easy and cruise. Allah Ta'ala 
reminds us over and over in the Quran, Islam is not a cruising religion. If you want to cruise, you're in the wrong religion. I'm not saying leave. I'm just saying you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, brother said if you want to cruise, become a Christian. I would have been that. You're not knocking Christians. No, don't leave. But you're going to be disappointed because this is not a cruising religion. This is a religion of struggle. وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ Strive in the way of Allah. وَاجْتَبَاكُمْ As should rightfully be the case. In other words, as much as you can. Because we'll never fulfill the right we owe to Allah. The right that's owed to Allah. حَقَّ جِهَادِ So just do the best you can. Give it your all. وَاجْتَبَاكُمْ He's chosen you. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ and made no difficulty for you in your deen. We pray five times, it could have been 50 times. And Musa alayhi salam, at first, during the uh, Mi'raj, used 50 times. But it was reduced to five, and then the five were given the multiplied 10 times over. Hasanat Ashram Thadiyah. So they're like 50. It's not difficult. We fast Ramadan. We, what if we were commanded to fast the whole year, or fast a month and skip a month? That's, that could have been the deen. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ It's made no difficulty for you in your deen. مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ It's the way of your forefather Abraham. So remind us, we have a spiritual lineage. We are the descendants of great people. We are the descendants, spiritually, of prophets. So we have Ummahatul Mu'mineen. The, the, probably most of us, there probably might be a Sayyid or two here, but most of us, we're not related to the Prophet by blood. There might be a Faruqi here, but most of us aren't related to Umar. There might be Siddiqi here. Maybe a lot of Siddiqis. But most of us aren't Siddiqis or Faruqis or Sayyids, Shurafa. But spiritually, we're from the family of Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alihi, the widest meaning is us. Includes us. Millati, millata abikum Ibrahim. This is the way of your father Abraham. So he, most scholars say Allah, some say Ibrahim. The majority of Allah has named you Muslims. So this is a name we got from, we received rather from Allah. It's honoring it. It's from Allah. What Allah gives is honorable. Don't dishonor what Allah has given. Who has said Muslimin. Previously, in the previous scriptures and in this Quran. Liyakuna Rasul Shahidan alaykum. So that the Prophet will be a witness against you. Watakunu shuhada'a ala nas. And you will be witnesses against humanity. You are witnessing is in the akhirah, it's in this world also as an example, but primarily in the Akhirah. If anyone says, Yawm al-Qiyamah, our Prophet didn't bring us the message, we will witness that they, their Prophet did bring them the message. We will witness against them. And if any of us were to say, I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to dress, I didn't know what to eat, the Prophet will witness against us. وَيَكُونَ رَسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَأَتُوا الزَّكَاةِ وَأَعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ هُوَ مَوْلَاكُمْ فَنِعْمَ الْمَوْلَى وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرُ So establish regular prayer, pay the zakat, and hold fast to Allah. Meaning we can't hold Allah, trust in Allah. ثِيقُوا بِاللَّهِ وَأَعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ ثِيقُوا بِاللَّهِ وَعَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهُ to the Qur'an, its teachings. It's, but وَعَتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ 
have trust in Allah. Allah is not going to betray you, brothers and sisters. Allah is not going to betray us. Allah is not going to abandon us. Allah is not going to forsake us. Allah is going to test us, but we meet the test with dignity and courage and patience. And the test, a lot of the tests are going to come through shaitan. So if we give ourselves to the religion and we're serious about the religion, Ya Yuhaladina and if we refuse to follow the way of Satan and his rebellion and his arrogance, so how does shaitan undermine our religion in ways that we might not perceive? Allah Ta'ala reminds us in the Qur'an, we'll give a few examples. So Allah Ta'ala says, Shaitan threatens you with poverty. And he commands you of that which is lewd and indecent. Wallahu ya'idukum mawfiratan minhu wa fa'la wallahu wa'asi'un alim. And Allah, he promises you forgiveness from him and from his bounty. And Allah is most expensive in his bounties, most knowledgeable of where to, pay, to, to deposit them. How does shaitan use the threat of poverty to undermine our religion? So, number one, he tells us not to spend when, when we really don't have too much. So when it's, there's a lot, he leaves us alone. He knows we'll spend. But when there's not so much, oh, you better hold on to that. Economy's bad. You lose your job. Hold on to that money. Don't let those Muslims encourage you to give all your money away. Hold on. So, do we trust in shaitan or do we trust in Allah? If we hold on, then our trust in Allah is eroded. Because Allah and His Messenger tells us to spend. Shaykh Hamza made an interesting statement recently. He said, the Qur'an is, one, is, is a book about fundraising. And I thought about it, but you start reading the Qur'an, the, the second thing Allah, third thing Allah says about the believers they spent. Then as you go through even Baqarah, over and over, spending, spending, spending. SubhanAllah. يا أيها الذين آمنوا أنفقوا مما رزقناكم من قبل أن يأتي يوم لا بيع فيه ولا خلة ولا شفاعة والكافرون هم الظالمون. Spend all you believers before a day comes and you won't be able to spend. سبحان الله. No, over at least in بقرة alone five six references to spending from the very beginning. Then throughout the Quran and one of the Verses on spending is the following. So shaitan says, you know, you only have this little bit of water. So if someone asks you for some water, you better hold on to it. You don't have the big gulp. You have the little Dixie <clears throat> cup. So you better hold on to that second one. You might get thirsty. Talking makes you thirsty. So I hold on, or you hide it, so no one sees it. <laughs> what does that do? One of the verses in spending, You will never attain righteousness until you spend from what you love. Until you spend from that which is going to make you say, ouch. So if shaitan can get us to be stingy and not to trust in the promise of Allah and not to trust in the promise of the Prophet ﷺ, أَنْفِقْ يَبْنَ آدَمَ 
unfiq alayk. Spend, O oh child of Adam, you will be spent on. So, the gates to righteousness are blocked. لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ And when the gates of righteousness are blocked, then we become open to the indecent and the perverse. الشيطان يعذكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء Shaitan threatens you with poverty and commands you with that which is vile and indecent. <coughs> so, we, we, we fear his threat of poverty and we stop spending. And then we don't spend. And the gates of righteousness, bir, are blocked. And the gates of fahsha are opened up. And it could be avoided by trusting the promise of Allah. Wallahu ya'idukum maghfira. Allah promised you forgiveness. Wa fadla. And his bounty. His grace. And Allah controls everything. Allah ta'ala controls everything. You know, look, look, mashallah, MCA, nice center. When was this center? When was it built? When was it purchased? It was purchased right at the time of the financial collapse. And Allah gave the believers the money. And we had Zaytuna College said, man, you got this building in Berkeley. When was it purchased? It was purchased after the financial collapse, after all this economic trauma. Because Allah, Allah's in charge, not Wall Street. Allah controls the wealth, not Wall Street. So Allah says, spend, I will give you. Spend, I will spend on you. And shaitan says, don't spend, you will keep your money. Shaitan <laughs> only promises deception. He promises deception. You, you say, oh no, hold on to your money, you'll keep it. Allah can take it anyway and give it to someone else who'll spend it. And we see it happening all the time. Another way, Ya ayyuhal nas kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba wa la tatabiru khutuwaat shaytan innahu lakum aduun mubeen O people, humanity, eat of that which is in the earth Lawful and pure, halal and tayyiba, halal and tayyiba, and don't follow the footsteps of Sh Satan. He is unto you and an avowed enemy. You are what you eat. Eat of the good and pure. So when 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 the man prays to Allah, and then his prayer is an answer, even though he has all the uh, ostensible causes. All the surface causes for a prayer being answered. فَذَكَرَ الرَّجُلَ And it's at the end of mentioning the pure. إِنَّ اللَّهُ طَيِّبًا وَلَا يَقْبِلُوا إِلَّا طَيِّبًا Allah is good and pure. He only accepts that which is good and pure. And then at the end of the hadith, فَذَكَرَ الرَّجُلَ He mentions the man. يُتِيلُ السَّفَرُ He's traveled a long way. دُعَى الْمُسَافِرُ مُسْتَجَابُ أَشْعَثَ أَغْبَرَ So he's disheveled and covered with dust, so he looks like a miskin. He looks like someone who's poor and impoverished. The, the dua al-mustadaf, mustajab. So dua al-musafir, mustajab. Yutilu safar. Ash'atha akhbara. Dua al-mustadaf, mustajab. Yamuddu yadehi ila sama. He stretches his hands to the sky, one of the adab of the prayer. We had the rain prayer. The Prophet Sallallahu he did the rain prayer and he stretched his arms up until the people could see his armpits, beseeching Allah. It's from the adab of the prayer. Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, to call on Allah through his hububiyah. It's from the adab of the prayer. He has all that. Why isn't his prayer answered? 
haram. The first thing he mentioned, his food is haram. Allah Ta'ala, what did he say? Kulu mimma fil ardi halalan tayyiba. Mat'amuhu haram. Wa mashrabuhu haram. Wa malbasuhu haram. Wa qudhiya bil haram fa anna yustajabu lah. His food, his drink, his clothing are haram. How is his prayer ever going to be answered? So this is a way shaitan gets to undermine the people. Don't worry about how the money you're buying your food. Don't worry about if the food is pure or not. If, if that animal is treated properly and raised properly and properly slaughtered, that animal wants you to eat him. That's what he's been put here for. He doesn't want someone who's a, a, a sinner to eat him. Because once you eat him, part of that animal physically is going to be caught part of your blood, part of your cells. Well, how is our blood replenished? How are our cells replenished? He's physically going to be part of us. He wants to be part of our prayer. He wants to be part of our fasting. He wants to be part of our recitation of Quran. Then there's spiritual qualities. What about an animal that's in some feedlot and cramped in with thousands of other animals, knee deep in manure, antibiotics because there's so much bacteria in the manure you have to pump the animal with antibiotics. Some wants to do, some of you see on the it was on the <laughs> that did some of you see like that's Probably no one did, but someone might have. It was on the BBC website. Anyway, the story on the BBC website was about the disappearance of the vultures in India. Anyone see that? All right, this is your homework. It's, it's called uh, Mankind's Best uh, Dust Men, or something like that. In any case, you know why the vultures disappeared in India? Because they were giving the cows a vaccination that was poison. And when the vultures were eating the dead cows, they were getting poisoned and dying. Now, what about people who are eating the cows? I know a lot of people in India don't eat cows. But what about those who do? The, the, the poison, they're giving the cow poison to protect it, that's killing the vultures. And so the, the story, so now you have all of these dead animals rotting all over the place and spreading all kinds of disease. The vultures actually eliminating these carcasses and preventing the spread of a lot of diseases. So the point is, we're pumping the animals with all of these uh, chemicals, antibiotics, and poison, then we're eating those animals, hormones. We're, we're eating those animals, we're drinking that milk. So what is it doing to us? And, and there's, they say that uh, 250 Americans out of 310 million have candida, or bad bacteria, or bacterial culture, which causes obesity, lack of focus, fatigue, etc. It all goes back to what we eat. And the, one of the main reasons, we mentioned the sugar, the starch, and the diets that are put in by the company. The sugar, sugar is a poison. They did experiments in the 40s and 50s. They fed dogs diets of sugar, they died. And the sugar companies covered it up. Now they're pumping un unfathomable amounts of sugar into our diet. It just has this glucose, fructose, high, high, high fructose corn syrup, sugar itself, aspartame. Uh, aspartame, they, they, had, they, they uh, manipulated the Food and Drug Administration to get it approved that it caused cancer and tumors in laboratory rats, test after test after test. And this is what we're doing to our children. This is what we're doing to ourselves. 
Allah says, eat of the good and pure. And don't follow the footsteps of Satan. So, so we, eat, we eat impure things. And it, it affects us spiritually. We are what we eat. We're eating products, not food. And we'll stop here. We'll continue next week. But just reflect on this. As human, food is cooked with, with love. A product is made by a machine. And so just as with all of these things, in many instances, if we overindulge, we become extensions of our machines. We become extension of that production process that produces our food. Because we are at the end of the line. You start with inputs, then there's an output, then there's consumption. We're the consumers. What does that do to us spiritually? That's a question we should ask ourselves. Allahum Mustan. So if you have questions, jot them down because we have to pray and uh, we'll start. I asked this earlier. I'll ask more emphatically next week if you have any questions. So anything you might be thinking about. So let's ask Allah to give us tawfiq. Subhanakum wa bihamdika shiran la ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa al-asr inna al-insana la tukhus. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما عنا قبل خالصا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك سبحانك لا تحصي ثناء عليك انت كما اثنيت على نفسك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وفي الحلم والعارفين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا قبل خالصا لوجهك الكريم سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يعصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم رحمة الله وبركاته So last week we hastily concluded so that being the case if there are any questions the, yes. So, what topics does the Prophet choose for his final lecture, and why? The topics we're going through. So, so why does he choose? Because I think these are the most vital issues in terms of maintaining a society that is infused with God consciousness. In other words, these are the things not building an economy based on riba, uh, not uh, having a, a social system that's characterized by riba. Anyway, can do this. So not building an economy based on interest. <clears throat> which opens the, the avenues to tremendous inequality in, inequalities in terms of wealth distribution. And with no riba, there's going to be a basic uh, leveling, if you will. <clears throat> you couldn't have billionaires without interest. And without interest, these disparities of wealth both nationally and internationally wouldn't be possible. Somebody. The mechanisms of war, we mentioned you couldn't finance a modern war machine without interest. It's all interest based. The financing that makes it possible because there's such a, a, a tremendous uh, financial investment that goes into maintaining, moving these uh, mechanized armies. Or even now with the uh, sa uh, satellite communications and laser-guided bombs and these, uh, these electronic digitalized networks of targeting. And all that takes tremendous amounts of money 
You couldn't do it without Levi. So, so and then the, the, the revenge in human affairs that sets brother against brother in many instances. So you, the Arab tribes, they're all Arabs who were engaged in these uh, blood feuds. Uh, and then what we were talking about, shaitan, like we see now in our day and time, the, the rise of the occult. The, uh, look, look at this, uh, you guys saw, in, in fact, I, I meant to bring it, this 19-year-old uh, this girl that was murdering guys, luring them on the Craigslist. She says they stopped counting how many people they killed. They were part of a satanic cult. And they just wanted to kill somebody. And this is what shaitan, everything that Allah and his messenger have uh, condemned, shaitan tries to uh, get people to engage in. So Allah and his messenger have condemned uh, gambling. Shaitan wants you to gamble. Allah has condemned alcohol. Shaitan wants you to drink alcohol. <laughs> so we create between you uh, enmity and hate, hatred with gambling and alcohol. Uh, uh, Allah Ta'ala condemns <coughs> men wearing gold. Shaitan wants men to wear gold. Allah Ta'ala condemns uh, al, al, men who imitate women and women who imitate men. Shaitan wants everyone to get into this uh, androgynous mess. So feminizing men. I, women are come, men complain like we can't find good women. And women complain we can't find good men. And one reason is the feminizing of men. Men who don't want to take responsibility. Men who don't want to, uh, to uh, uh, assert themselves and be virtuous. So yeah, men, they want to want to wear skinny jeans. And <laughs> so everything, if uh, Allah Ta'ala sanctified life, shaitan has, has, has uh, denigrated the value of life. And a lot of these occult rituals require human sacrifices. A lot of these kids you see on the side of the milk carton were kidnapped by, by Satanists. Allah, Allah Ta'ala has dignified uh, a women. Shaitan hates women and, and, and wants women to be defiled through pornography and all of these things. So in condemning and warning against Satan, the Prophet Sallallahu is Again, laying the foundations for a society that's going to be permeated by God consciousness. What's the first thing he said? I, I, I admonish you, advise you, O oh servants of Allah, to be mindful of Allah and to obey Him. And what does shaitan want? He wants, he wants you to rebel.